Welcome everybody out there in, in Zoom land and in Facebook land and YouTube land, wherever you may be. Tonight is an awesome, awesome and amazing evening. Um, my name is Brother Warren, representing Peace, which stands for Please Educate All Children Equally. We have an awesome and amazing guest tonight. First of all, first of all, this series is centered on not just Black History Month, but Black History 365 every single day. However, we're using this opportunity of this month to honor some history about our culture. Today, beyond Black History Month, why learning Black history outside of school is a must. My guest for this evening, before I get there, let me just take a moment of silence to recognize one of our panelists tonight who's taken ill, Baba Joe, Baba Joe Foster. Everyone who knows him, and if you don't know him, please send him a prayer for a speedy recovery. But this evening, this evening, we have one of our panelists who's jumping on tonight, Dr. Drew Brown. Good evening, Brother Brown. How you doing, sir? Doing great, doing great, doing great. Glad to see you on here. Hey, listen, you have so many things on <laughs> your resume. So many things, and so many things we just talked about. Um, Tell the people a little bit about yourself, what you want them to know. There's so many things there. I don't want to read. Everything is there. So you go ahead. You tell them. Yeah. So um, originally, I'm from, from Windsor, Ontario, Canada, right outside Detroit, Michigan. So um, Canadian, born and bred. Uh, came over here to play football. So I played collegiate football, a little bit of professional football, and then went to grad school at Clark Atlanta and Temple University, where I got my master's and my PhD, both in African-American studies. Um, so this is a perfect platform for me. I'm coming from um, Gamma Mu New Chapter in Middletown, Delaware, and uh, we got to re got to represent my home chapter there. Um, but I'm I'm ha happy to be on here. Happy to talk to you about African civilization and about um, Black folks and sort of our connection to the past and history and the significance of it. Uh, more importantly, I think that we have have many people here that um, always ask me the question, you know what makes us African and what is the value of actually understanding our African heritage and roots. And so I'm happy to get into that stuff with you, um, not just the history of it, but also the significance of why we should be understanding this stuff. Awesome. Amazing. And wait a minute, I believe I see brother Dr. Chiki. What's up, my Chiki? What's up, my man? How you doing? Good brother. I am blessed, brother. Just finishing up class here at Clark Atlanta University. I know. It's a blessing to be here with you all. I know, I know. Appreciate you, brother. We had a busy schedule, but I'm glad you were able to jump in after class, man. So we're just talking a little glad bit. To, glad, to, glad to see you at my, my alma mater there. Yes, sir. All with my, right. With my, with, my, with my mentor, Dr. Black. I should have known. I should have known you were a Panther, brother. And a member of the Ballhead <laughs> Brotherhood as well. There we go. There we go. I'm actually kind of new. Kind of only a couple months. Only a couple months here. All right. You wear well. <laughs> hey, hey, so, hey, so, hey, so, brother Chike. So, I was basically just, um, you know, introducing, you know, Doc, Dr. Brown, um, and essentially, like your resume. Tell the people what you want them to know about you, because I could read a whole entire book about all the things that you've done so far, brother. Well, my background is actually as a middle grades educator. I was a language arts teacher and reading specialist for fourteen years. Uh, let me see. 11 years as a language arts teacher, three years as a reading specialist. And um, I am very passionate about the subject matter of tonight's discussion because what I noticed in my teaching was that my students increased and improved their engagement and achievement when I infused African and African-American history and culture into my language arts class. It, it made it, not only did it make a dramatic impact in terms of their engagement and achievement, it made a dramatic impact in terms of their behavior. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm a firm believer um, that we have to make sure that we infuse that teaching um, into the curriculum because there's so many, um, so much erroneous information out there. I'm the author of 11 books um, and I am the, uh, the co-convener of the Teacher Transformation Institute, where we use standards-based, research-driven, Afrocentric, and culturally relevant uh, 
teaching strategies to increase Black student engagement and achievement. So we go into school districts, uh, educational conferences, and we teach teachers how to bring out the brilliance in Black children and children of color. So all of the professional development that we provide to leaders and teachers and all of the curriculum that we've developed is for that purpose. Yes, and I've been the benefactor of several of your works and some that are behind me, some that I've given to teachers over the years as educator at various schools in the Philadelphia area. So I'm gonna share my screen just for a few moments because I have to give a shout out to And everyone can see that. You can hear me now? Yep. So this particular series is being brought to you by my organization, Peace, which stands for Please Educate All Children Equally, but also the Middletown Odessa Town Zen chapter of the NAACP, which I've partnered with them to create this series for the month of February. So it's in, in recognition of Black History Month, but as we all know, we celebrate being Black 365 days per year. So just a quick little statement, looking at the fair use statement, you know, portions of this broadcast may be copyrighted material. The use of which has not been specifically authorized by the copyright owner. I've determined this to be fair use of the copyrighted material as referenced and provided for in section 107 of the copyright law for the United States. So just putting that out there, I do not own all the content that's being shared tonight, but it's being used for educational purposes. So we're fine. So in looking at this particular image here, Carter G. Woodson, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, our frat brother, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, those in Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Um, you know, it saddens me sometimes when I get around this time of the year, and I just happen to walk in certain spaces and I wear a shirt with his face. And every person, white, black, brown, most people, 90 something percent, don't know who he is on site. You know, and it's usually a lot of us. And I'm talking about older people, elder, elderly people who actually are educators, right? and don't know this and are tasked with teaching our children. So, you know, I'm sharing this image right here now tonight because everybody on site, in my humble opinion, just as you see George Washington and recognize him on site, you know, if you're from the di diaspora, you should see this brother right here and recognize him on site as well. You guys, any, any want to chime in about that a little bit at all? There's so much to say about yeah. <laughs> Carter G. Woodson. I mean, his, his work resonates with me so much because he was he was a scholar as well as a teacher and a businessman, wow. uh, which is just the same as me. So he was a publisher. So it wasn't enough for him to develop a scholarly critique and to conduct research. He then took it upon himself to, to build a business around that and, and to a publishing company because he couldn't rely on other people to publish uh, the powerful work that he was producing. And I found the same to be true with uh, with what I was doing. And so I feel like a great deal of my work is a continuation um, of his work. Absolutely. And I, I know a lot of your work have, like I said before, several of the books here and, and DVDs and things of that nature. And whatnot. So here's just a narrative on Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Those out there, you can screenshot these things that I show so you can come back to them later on. Here's, if you didn't know anything about Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the fact that he ultimately created Negro History Week, which later became Black History Month because of the unrest that took place at Kent State in the early 70s. And then after that, you know, I think the presidents um, began to recognize, you know, our month, you know, um, around 1976 and it's been kind of recognized ever since then so real, real, real quick real quickly real quickly um dr Woodson writes writes this book miseducation the negro and i think it's important to understand what kind 100%. of motivated him what motivated him to write this book right um in the early 1900s like 1903 or so so he leaves america and goes to the philippines and while he's teaching in the philippines he's teaching this this curriculum and he's realizing that um, the people, the people that are are um, that are Filipino or whatnot, in sorry, in the Philippines are are learning a history and learning a curriculum that is not theirs. They're actually learning this mm. sort of colonized version of this curriculum. And he's saying, "Yo, you guys aren't even really learning the stuff about you. You're learning stuff that other people want you to know and think about yourselves." There's like a miseducation going on here. And then he's like, "Well, hold on a minute. That's what's going on with the Negroes back home." Right, And so he comes back right. and he's like, no, the same thing that I was doing over there trying to fight against 
is what's happening here. There's a miseducation going on by this sort of colonial rule trying to teach Black folks about themselves in a way that is detrimental to themselves. And that's why he really writes this book. Mm. And I, I would add to that that, um, you know, it started off as Negro History Week and evolved into Black History Month. But the mm -hmm. idea was not just to take a month or a week to study our history. That week and that month was supposed to be a culmination and a celebration of mm -hmm. what you were learning all year long. So every year that I was a teacher, my students would always ask me, uh, at that time, Mr. Akua, uh, what is, um, what, why is Black History Month the shortest month of the year? And my response would always be, well, Black History Month is every month for you. That, right. That's, you know, for other, for other folks. So, um, it, and it didn't have anything to do with the fact that it was the shortest month as you have in there. Um, he chose that the month of February or the week that he chose was because it was around the birthday of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. But it's important to know that it wasn't just meant to study our history during that week. It was the culmination of what you had been studying throughout the year. Right. Absolutely. Let me get, just go to the next slide real quick. So why is learning Black history outside of school is a must? Why? Why? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and part of that, I'm going to show this graphic here. As you look here, there are approximately 12 states right now. Now, if you look at some of the names of some of those states, Florida being included, the one where I am right now, you know, uh, Delaware and other states and so on and so forth. These are states that claim to have made uh, passed legislation to say that, you know, Black history must be taught. Now, how is being taught? Is it being taught with fidelity? Are people just checking boxes? I can say definitely that there's, um, based on the people that I've talked to in a couple of these states, that in some cases, boxes are just being checked, right? And, you know, and then in some cases, you know, it's actually being trying to be removed in that, you know, by different people that are out there making their things, making their movements, about trying to, you know, erase us from the history, you know, through those kinds of things. Um, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I'm going to let Doc jump in here. And, and I mean, I just want to say some quick words, I guess, and I'll let you kind of take it. This is more um, your area. But, you know, there are different ways to teach Black history, right? We can teach Black history and say that Europeans went over to Africa and saw uncivilized beings and decided they were going to help civilize them, right? That's one way to teach about Black history, right? Mm -hmm. the, the thing is that obviously that's a very oppressive and degrading perspective to have. And so how we teach about Black people is just as important as what we're teaching, right? If not more important. Um, and so this is this is why it's important to under, to, uh, to have the right type of perspective and curriculum in these K through 12 Black history or Black studies um, courses and, and curriculum. Uh, I'll also say that Malcolm X has a great quote that we always have to remember when he says, only a fool will let his oppressor teach his children. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important to hold on to that because I think it's important for us to remember the history of our, our of, of the way we've been oppressed and how we then entrust the education of our children in those same structures and institutions that we're trying to destroy us and may continue continue to be doing so. Listen, I can say this. I'm going to jump in for one second. As a former principal in Philadelphia, and I used to do a lot of observations of teachers there was this one gentleman who was the social studies teacher who had been one for 20 something years or whatever. And every day, and I think he did it to really get on my nerves. He would be teaching about the cotton gin. Like every lesson, when I walked in, he would pull out this lesson about the cotton gin. And so, you know, it didn't go well for him after a while. Cause I, you know, the kids, they were not engaged. And then I would go in there and I would try to like, you know, try to fix what he was doing, but he was doing it on purpose. He definitely has some, some issues. I'll just say it like that. So yes, to what you just said, it's not about just teaching things. It's what you're teaching, how you're teaching, are you inspiring, are you uplifting, and so on and so forth, and whatnot. So I just had to get that out because you just kind of triggered me when you said that. This dude with this cotton gin every single time, and I'm like, yeah, okay, he, he has to go. Coach him up, coach him out. I coached him out. What you what you just gave an example of is what the research literature calls spirit murder. Mm. Spirit murder of black children that our that our right. children's their very essence and spirit is being murdered in so many classrooms that are not only not teaching about the truth about their history and culture, but are actually teaching the exact opposite. So when you ask why should we be teaching about our history and culture at home, 
Um, when you look at, uh, so, well, for example, Dr. Brown uh, gave a quote from Malcolm, which I, th I think is so profound and always must be uh, lifted up. Uh, Malcolm's teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, if a man won't treat you right, what makes you think he'll teach you right? Mm -hmm. So we have to bear those things in mind. So if we go back to Dr. Woodson, Dr. Woodson said there are two kinds of education, the kind that you're given and the kind you must give yourself. The kind we must give ourselves is what happens outside the classroom and hopefully should be happening at home. Malefi Asante says it this way. He says uh, that we have to take two sets of notes. The first set of notes is the, the notes that the, the, the teacher or the professor assigns you. The second set of notes are, are the notes that, that your ancestors require of you to go above and beyond. So for example, when I was working on my doctorate, um, you know, I would do what the professors asked, but then I had to consult our scholars and they oftentimes were not necessarily assigning the class to read the best of our scholars. So for every assignment, I had to ask myself, what does Asa Hilliard have to say about this? What does Wade Nobles have to say about this? What does Naeem Akbar have to say about this? What does Marimba Ani and, and the litany of black scholars that I know, I feel like I earned two doctorates because I was doing that for almost every assignment. And so our children must be rooted and grounded in our knowledge, in our worldview, in our way of seeing things. That way, when they get in schools where their culture may not be elevated and celebrated, they'll still have enough of a sense of self to get what they need and keep it moving. Right. Absolutely. And, and, and also, and also, I, I think that that raises a great point, right? That the way in the way in which we're teaching our children one has to do with the, the content and the subject matter and things like that. But I also think we have to do it in a way that's more, that's holistic, right? Understand that we're teaching subject matters and we're teaching history, but we're also teaching love. We're also teaching uh, having pride in oneself and one's ancestors and one's heritage. We're also teaching how to treat other people based on what our ancestors have taught us and based on the philosophies that have come out of, out of out of civilizations that we're connected with and are more harmonious with us, right? That another, another a teacher in school can read a book and teach the, the, the words from that book to, so that the students regurgitate that. But are they teaching how this is harmonious with our way of life, how this is harmonious with our community structures, right? These things are very much um, a native to our heritage. And that's why it's important for us to be able to do that work holistically. 100%, 100%. Education is liberation. Let's free their minds and, you know, the rest will follow. Um, I think it came from a song. I forget what song it came from, but yeah, I just kind of spit that bar real quick. Listen, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and also follow up, you have to shout them out a little bit because they've actually created, you know, a graduation requirement. Uh, we have to take a course. Now, again, it all depends on who's teaching the course. And, you know, Ishmael Jimenez couldn't be here this evening. He's traveling. His plane got caught up and everything. I plan for him to be on next week. But he is definitely doing some great work right now in the Philadelphia area. I'm um, doing the Saturday workshops. I was a guest on one of those. Doing a lot of things in Philadelphia, uh, promoting the culture, you know, making sure. And I call him in the Philadelphia School District. I call him like a, a superhero of Black history in the Philadelphia School District. Him, and got a shout out, Yasin Muhammad, who's, you know, an administrator now, but he, they both did some great work in Philadelphia. So Philadelphia will be celebrating, I think, their 20th year uh, next year that they've actually started Black history as a graduation requirement um, next year in 2025. So have to shout them out real quick. So for all the things, you know, that we just talked about, those who have no record of what their forebearers have accomplished lose the inspiration, which comes from the teaching of biography and history, but not. So we must, we must authentically make sure that in the home, see things are happening. And just like so many others, I definitely didn't get that. You know, I got from my grandma as much as I could, which she, which she could give me. And a couple of day camps, shout out to the ancestors, John Skeef and those that started the Harambe day camp. Because when I would go to Harambe day camp, I would get some more there. But in terms of K to 12 school, other than Martin Luther King, that was pretty much it. And even going to my university, you know, shout out to Chan University, the blueprint of HBCU, the oldest HBCU in the country. Um, the curriculum that I took wasn't geared towards that. However, the friends that I met, you know, and I would go to the different bookstores, whether it be Hakeem's bookstore, you know, Black and Noble bookstore, Know Thyself bookstore, and collect these books and listening to people like, you know, KRS One, Parmi Ture, you know, when he would come to the university. Um, also, um, 
Public Enemy, and they inspired me to go get these books that said so similar to you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Cool, where I would like take my major, but I was getting these other books and I was just sitting around building and ciphering and getting this knowledge of stuff and whatnot, which is very, very important because I wasn't getting it in the schools that I had attended. So mm. this is why learning Black history outside of school was a must. It definitely has to happen. You can't rely on a school, even though we're pacing mandates to teach your children about themselves at home, in the community. It has to happen there. And if the school does it, great. And then even challenge the information you're getting in the school, because like we said before, you know, if it's not done with love and authenticity to make them a greater people, it's to do more harm than good at the end of the day. Yeah. Let me just let me just ask that about just speaking about Philadelphia School District. Sure. Um, you know, there's lots of bureaucracy around changing curriculum, right? Even when it comes to Delaware or Florida, right, that we can have all of these proposals and all of these plans to be able to teach Black history, Black culture, Black studies within K through 12, but then it has to go through all of the red tape. And we right. see how when it reaches certain levels, it gets shut down. Um, I think that there's a, a great brother, Reginald Streeter, who's a president of the Philadelphia School Board right now. And um, he comes out of Temple University um, and, and, and did African-American studies under uh, Malefi Asante and all of that. But understanding that even he can't just push uh, mm -hmm. curriculum change, right? That it has to go through a process. And that process can be tedious and there are a lot of hurdles and challenges that it's going to face. And so I think that um, just kind of recognizing that period, that point uh, is, is also a reason why we need to make sure that we're doing it at home, right? So because at, yeah. at home, um, there should be less uh, red tape and, and bureaucracy that it may go through. It, it may go through some, right? You got to check with the spouse and things like that. But, um, you know, it, I think that it's a, a way that we can ensure that our children are getting that type of work. Yeah, absolutely. And and definitely to um, extend that, you know, parents that are out there that are watching or listening, but not your children that have all these smartphones, let's actually use them within our culture to make our children smarter rather than all the other fun stuff that they do. And the stuff that they shouldn't be doing is use this opportunity to use these smart walking around with an encyclopedia in their hand, a research device in their hand. Use it to become actually smarter, especially when it comes to our culture. So um, we're going to go with these these few points and we'll just uh, show a couple of clips and talk about some things. And we'll just like, you know, speak what we know about these things. Evolution of mankind, the oldest civilization of Africa the most remarkable civilizations in West Africa and resources for parents. And um, this here particular segment is entitled Africans Before European Oppression. So how do we know Africa is the cradle of modern humanity? Why is this important for everyone to know, especially those that specifically identify as being a part of the diaspora? And what other thoughts do you have about the evolution of mankind? So what I'm doing right now is just show a short clip, a short clip, Science Magazine presents Artipithecus Rhinus, sure about five minutes the most of this. detailed picture of early hominid life. On the cover of Science, there is the partial skeleton of a remarkable human ancestor. Can you hear that, fine? This is that? Artipithecus Ramidus, and a team of international researchers introduced this hominid, member of the human family that lived 4.4 million years ago, which is about a million years older than Lucy's species, and they flesh it out. And what they are telling us in these 11 articles is that it doesn't look just like us, which is not surprising. You wouldn't invite them to dinner, but it doesn't look just like a chimpanzee either, which is a big surprise. So instead of thinking of something in between a chimp and a human, we have to think of this as really not a series of links in a chain as much as branches in a tree. And our branch is a very peculiar branch. We have very strange feet and huge brains. How, how did that happen? Well, we have to work our way back down our branch. And so we're getting pretty close to the fork that was between the line that led off to the chimpanzees and the line that led off to us. And Artipithecus takes us pretty far back toward that branch and informs us that the node point, the junction, the last common ancestor, was neither human nor a chimpanzee. It was something entirely different. It's living on the ground, walking upright like us, spending a lot of time walking upright. If you saw it walk by, the walk would look a lot like ours, but it can't run like us. The skeleton that we have is estimated to be around four feet tall 
and to weigh around 100, 110 pounds. And so that's why skeletons are important. They allow you to get at things like stature, limb proportions, and, and all of that. And I think one of, the, one of the things that we would be most impressed by seeing, seeing Artipithecus in the, in the flesh would be the very small size of her face and brain, brain case, the very large size of her arms and hands, and this grasping ability of her feet. She had a foot with an opposable large toe. It's the first time we've ever seen this in a fossil hominid. All the rest of them, even the Lucy species, fairly early at 3.7 to 3.2, and even with footprints in the foot. Speed up just a little bit because there's, there's one key point that I want to be known. So about right there. We have fossil wood, fossil seeds. We have fossil millipedes. We have birds. We have very small mammals. And all of these very sensitive environmental indicators build up to a picture of a woodland habitat that's now been sampled just by geological forces where the exposures of this ancient horizon are present. It's, it used to be very different from what it is today. The traditional view for the past 50 years has been that our ancestors arose in the grassy savannas of Africa. I'm just pausing it right there because ultimately, you know, um, and well, I'll stop sharing the screen for right now so we can just have some conversation around that. The evolution of mankind and how do we know Africa is the cradle of modern humanity. Um, what do you have to add to that? It's been verified for years. And for those that may not know, that is the case. What do you have to say to speak to that particular um, fact? Either, either one of you. I'd like to share something that Asa Hilliard uh, talked about in his research. And he said um, that what we know as a result of research is that the first woman in man came out of Africa and the last woman in man came out of Africa. And what he meant by that was not only the, the one that they were looking at before uh, Australopithecus, I forgot the name that they gave it, but the first one going back 4.4 million years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that they came from out of Africa, but also the modern human being. And the reason that it's important to make that distinction is because somebody could say, well, okay, the first people, you know, that 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 the first humans uh, came out of Africa, but they were ape-like or chim chimpanzee-like. It wasn't until they got into Asia or Europe that they became like humans as we know it. And that's not true. As I right. said, the first woman and man, as well as the last human and man, uh, woman and man, modern woman and man came out of Africa as well. So it's important to understand that distinction. Absolutely, absolutely. And then the video actually goes into that a little bit. It just kind of link these. I'm going to have our feedback, have our conversation on that. But definitely it's important to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Brown, anything you'd like to add, Dr. Brown? Yeah, I, I don't want to get, I want to jump the gun here, but, you know, just looking at when it comes to not just the last human, uh, the last human being, or last mankind, um, but also the civilizations that begin in Africa, right? That right. the civilizations begin in in thirty eight hundred BC, right? In Africa, well, we, we don't we don't really get we don't really get to uh, um, we don't really get those civilizations in Greece until like seven fifty BC. We're talking about three thousand years, right, of civilizations in Africa before Greece starts to become this big powerhouse civilization. And of course, we can draw the, the, uh, the connections at, and, and see how ancient Kemet has certainly had an influence, a heavy influence, I would say, on the civilization of Greece. If we're saying that Greece um, civilized the world, well, we can, we can most likely say that, that, uh, that Greece was heavily influenced by ancient Kemet. Which takes us to our next our next point, right? Actually takes us to our next point. So let me share that screen. While you're bringing that up, consider sure. the fact of what, what Dr. Brown just mentioned when he talks about how Kemet was at least 3,000 years older than ancient Greece. Consider the fact that America isn't even 300 years old yet. Right. Just kind of put that in perspective in your mind. And you're talking about a civilization 
that was politically active for 3,000 years. Again, Asa Hilliard makes a distinction between political Kemet and cultural Kemet, which even extended back thousands of years prior to, uh, to, to that 3,000 years we were talking about. Absolutely. So and I, I, know, think, so I think I think that, I think that, I think that's an important point to make. Also, because when we talk about Black history, right, the Black history here in America is such a small piece mm. of the larger history that goes back thousands of years, right? And so when we're talking about how are we connected to our heritage, we're talking about this being a, a significant piece, right, uh, a relevant piece, but a small piece of our longer history. Yeah, Absolutely. They, don't, they don't even teach us the truth about what happened here. Dr. David Imhotep has a book called The First Americans Were Africans. And he mm. demonstrates mm. with archaeological evidence that African people were here 53,000 years ago. And so mm. when people considered to be Native Americans, in large measure, were Africans that were already here. So that's but that's a whole nother story. We'll I'll, I'll, we'll stick to Kevin for right now. <laughs> listen, he's dropping, listen, but drop them seeds, though, brother. Listen, so here, right here, you have the master keys for understanding ancient Kevin. And I know, Dr. Coach, just based on what I've read on things that you've studied, that you're definitely a, a student of all those people that you mentioned, and specifically in this case, um, looking at Dr. Asa Hillier, right? And the master keys introduction. So I'm just going to play a little bit of this here for the people out there who may not have seen this before. I'm sure you could probably be. Spit it verbatim, but I'm going to share it for everyone out there just viewing right now. A small clip. And you can tell me to stop anytime you like. We should use the term Kemet rather than the term Egypt because that is the name that the Kemetic people use to refer to themselves. The name Egypt was used by Greek people and is therefore a foreign name, not a native African or a native Egyptian name. Lister Velt Middleton, one of the leading educational television producers on African history. Why is ancient Kemet so important to the world and to black people, African people in particular? Ancient Kemet is important because it's humankind's oldest civilization. It's the development of the best effort of a group of people to organize themselves. And for Africa, that's especially important since African people have been so defamed, even to the extent that some have said that African people had no civilization. In fact, African people developed the first civilization, which was Kemet. It is as important to African people as Greece is to European people. What did these Africans develop in the way of science and well, of course, in the development of civilization, we would refer to Kemet as a high technical civilization. Uh, the sciences as we know them were well advanced in Kemet uh, thousands of years before they re had that kind of development before. The art of writing, uh, astronomy, uh, the uh, mu music, any area that we now consider to be an important academic area already had its uh, beginning in Kemet, and it was very well developed. Now you know, mm. a lot of African Americans watching this will say now, what do the descendants of African slaves in the United States have to do with these ancient Africans in Kemet or Egypt? Well, it's important for any group of people to have a sense of or to have the ability to answer three questions about themselves. And these questions are Booker T. Washington Coleman, a Washington, D.C. historian's questions that he uses in organizing his educational experiences for children. He says, every human being ought to be able to answer the question, who am I? Where in the world am I? How in the world did I get here? Mm -hmm. Now, most well-developed nations spend millions, maybe billions of dollars answering those questions for themselves. That's why you have 
Smithsonian Institution for the United States. Uh, that's why you have libraries. That's why you have universities that invest in history departments and so forth. Uh, African people have almost forgotten because we haven't had the resources to take care of that part of our existence. It is the knowledge of one's history that gives a strong sense of belonging and identity which provides the basis for group unity, which provides the basis for political and economic power. Mm -hmm. What is the, the connection, the genetic connection, the cultural connection uh, between the, the Africans who are now in the, in the United States and those of ancient Kemet or Egypt? Well, it's fairly clear that the pattern of movement of people on the African continent, and it moves from... Uh, we'll go to the map. It moves from uh, beginnings here in the Nile Valley beginnings, okay. where the Nile River actually starts right here, and it will go down here, joined by another Nile, the white, the blue Nile coming from Ethiopia, the white Nile coming from here, joining here and coming this way. So the mi migration pattern of human beings was down this river into Egypt, and then there were migration patterns over into West Africa many times, and some of the time the migration actually went from Egypt into across the top of the Sahara and into these parts. And We believe there are people here now who are quite similar and probably as was said in the book uh, by Felix Du Bois, Timbuktu the Mysterious, they're probably both the culture and the genetic descendants of the people of Egypt, and they're the Dogon people here in Mali. Let me ask you to go over that again, just to make sure that right. that we that we uh, get all of okay, it. Okay, early man begins here in this area. Somewhere. And we're talking about the cultural we're connection, the genetic connection. We're talking about the people first, the uh -huh. genetic connection, and then of course they carry mm -hmm. their culture down the them? river. These were black Absolutely. people here. They carry their Man, I could listen to Dr. Hilliard all day, but Yeah, I know you can. I thought what you do your thing. I, I wanna point out what he's talking about right now because when we start talking about Kemet, which today people know as Egypt, people would say, Well, that you know, that's fine, Dr. Kula, but you know, you're African Americans were taken from West Africa. So you don't have a connection to ancient Kemet. Well, that's not true. Uh, it is true that we were, that our ancestors were captured from West Africa, but it is not true that we don't have a connection to Kemet. What Dr. Hilliard is calling our attention to here, um, and, and he found out later in his research, because this video is from the 1980s, but what they discovered was that there were six documented mass migrations out of the Nile Valley of Africa. And those migrations happened as a result of invaders and colonizers, the Assyrians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. And when they inundated the Nile Valley, there were six mass migrations from out of Kemet and the Nile Valley to West Africa. But when the people left the Nile Valley, they took their culture with them, and they built the great empires of Ghana and Mali and Songhai. So Dr. Hasimi Maiga, who hails from Mali, he says, West Africans are not really West Africans. They're really East Africans who traveled West. I'm going to say that again because that could be kind of confusing. West Africans are not really West Africans. They're really East Africans who traveled West. And so when you go to West Africa, you can see the cultural retentions of ancient Kemet. As a matter of fact, uh, you have um, the Dogon people, as he mentioned, who have very similar language, customs, sciences, and so forth. Um, I was, la in 2022, I was installed as a chief in Ghana. And one of the reasons they did that is because in the Isabu region of Ghana, where I was installed, uh, they know their history of being the descendants of the ancient Kemites. Uh, but they were also in need of other scholars and researchers to help them continue to piece together that history. So I just wanted to point out those couple of things. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's all. First of all, congratulations. I, don't, I think I just just learned that now about them be installing you um, over there mm -hmm. in Ghana. That's an awesome achievement. And, you know, West Africans were actually East Africans. And I think about I don't want to jump too ahead, too far ahead. But I think about Mansa Musa, for example, and a lot of trade that he did. 
you know, and going back and forth, you know, to that region and whatnot at that time. So I think that has a large, plays a large, large part in that, what you mm -hmm. just said, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's definitely that connection. Yeah. There's a linguistic connection, mm -hmm. a spiritual and theological connection, a scientific connection. It's, it's all there for those that take the time uh, to learn it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I think that I think it's clear as to where the connections are. Like you said, if you take the time to learn it right, there's a connection from um, ancient Kemet, a connection to West Africa and a connection from West Africa, obviously, to the Americas. If you take the time to learn that, we're, we're very much connected. And I, I, I always think of the story that uh, my dissertation chair, Malefi Asante, starts out with in one of his books, talking about, about the crow, um, the baby crow that falls into the chicken coop, right? And does that does that crow ever become a chicken, right? Mm. The other chickens can teach it to, you know, cluck like a chicken, to do what chickens do. But at the end of the day, when that when that uh, when that eagle realizes that there are other eagles that can fly, unlike the chickens, then all of a sudden it can start to fly. If we take the time to understand that we come from a long heritage and long history of greatness, we can tap into that, we can continue that, we can honor that and, and hopefully work to stand on the shoulders of our ancestors and work to work, uh, try to work with our ancestors and trying to um, create a path forward. I think I wanna make sure we don't miss the greatness of Kemet, right? Kemet is where mathematics was developed. It was where books were written on existence and spirituality. It, it was written on um, tech, uh, sorry, the, the, the architectural innovation and technology. Malefi Asanti says, Greece and Rome combined <laughs> can match the architectural legacy of Kemet. We're talking Talking about we're talking about pyramids here that they still don't know how they built them today. Hmm. They look back at these pyramids and they're so uh, technologically sound; they're almost perfect when it comes to um, when it comes to the degrees and angles that this thing is built on. They they literally cannot figure out how they built it. Some people will say uh, these folks they must have had the aliens help them. Literally, that is the argument, right? The aliens must have helped them, right? <laughs> but um, um, but we also can't forget to acknowledge the fact that the people of ancient Kemet were black. I hate that I gotta say it, but when you look at movies like like Cleopatra and all of that, these old school movies, I got I, I I have to acknowledge that these um, these folks of ancient Kemet were black folks, right? Even even you know the great Greek philosopher Herodotus goes there and says, yeah, they're 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 black people. These are black folks, right? Kemet. KMT Kemet uh, is it is interpreted as the land of the blacks, right. and so when we look at Kemet, and we look at the greatness of it. We have to also acknowledge these are black folks that were doing this. What I hate is that throughout history, and this is why it's important to understand this stuff. This narrative has been changed and and, and I would say uh, whitewashed, if you will, to say that well, the people of ancient Kemet eh, maybe they weren't black. Or I'll say the people of ancient Kemet ah, had helped by aliens to create these great monumental, you know, pyramids and sinks and all that stuff, right? And so we see how the how the how the, the the narrative then starts to get distorted. Um, the reason why this narrative gets distorted, I would say, is because folks don't want folks can't justify levels of white supremacy while also acknowledging how great black folks were during mm. the uh, ancient civilizations of Kemet, thousands of years before Greece. Yes. Right. That that's a problem. That's a problem for white supremacy, right? Yeah. And yeah. so when we when we see that, we see that um, if we continue to allow these things to go unnoticed, un, uh, forgotten, and unacknowledged, what we're doing is we're allowing this agenda of white supremacy to continue to do that and erase the very history and heritage that that really is ours. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And 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 brother Kuhu, so help so help me out with this here as well. So. I believe that one of the reasons that many of the um, the monuments, the the images, the statues had their noses like removed or, or shot off, I guess, is because they didn't want it to resemble the African. That's what I've been taught anyway. Is that through your research as well? Have you heard that as well? Or it's it's two aspects to that. That is part of okay. it. Okay. Um, and then also, um, oftentimes by the 
Kemetic people themselves, a way of defacing or defaming somebody's memory was to mm. cut off the nose. But we know that most of it was done by invaders who came uh, much, much later. Uh, they would uh, blast off the nose, the lips. These were the telltale signs yeah. that these were clearly African people. And a couple of right. things to, to kind of demonstrate that, like, for example, when Dr. Brown talks about the magnificence of the pyramids and, and as I go around the country and talk about these things, when I ask people, you know, who built the pyramids and what, what are the myths that are out there about it, it always comes up the notion of aliens, right? So I always have to debunk that myth because if you go into the Amos Mathematics Papyrus, which is the oldest math textbook in the world, you can see where they are uh, determining the slope of a pyramid. You can see what later people will call the Pythagorean theorem, uh, uh, attributed to Pythagoras, although Imhotep, who designed the first pyramid, came 2,000 years before Pythagoras. Uh, but in the Amos Mathematics Papyrus, you see examples of algebra, trigonometry, sine, cosine, cotangent, area, square root, circumference, volume, and you see them working on uh, calculations about developing a pyramid. Mm -hmm. We also know that they made mistakes. This is how we know it wasn't done by aliens. Also, they, we know their mistakes. They started off with the step pyramid, then they wanted to build a true pyramid. Uh, Seneferu, who wanted to build a true pyramid, made a mistake, mismeasured his angles, and you have what's called the bent pyramid. The angles are off. But then he goes back, remeasures, and they're able to create a true pyramid and then you have the Great Pyramid of Khufu and so on. So we know the development over time that it took for them to do that. In terms of their blackness, Shikanta Diop had 12 areas, 12 areas of empirical evidence to demonstrate that the ancient uh, Kemetic people were black. One of those areas of evidence was the famed melanin dosage test. And he said, if you'll give me a... Uh, uh, if you give me access to the royal mummies of Kemet, because the royal mummies were stolen and kept in the Louvre Museum in France, if you give me access to the royal mummies, I will take a skin sample and I will put that skin sample into a solution of ethyl benzoate. And when you shine a fluorescent light on it, the uh, melanocytes, which are the cells that hold the melanin, the skin pigment, they begin to become fluorescent. Well, and you can count and determine the skin tone of the person that you're uh, that you're analyzing. For two years, they wouldn't even give him access to the mummies. But when they finally did, something amazing happened. All of the mummies that he tested, in his words, and he's a dark-skinned African from Senegal, he said, they were black, black, more black than I. These are the words of Dr. Shikanta Diab. But that's mm -hmm. not the deep part. The deep part is, he said, that he had found that other people had performed the same experiment before them. And he knew because some of the mummies had had their skin scraped off. It didn't just fall off because of age. It happened because other people had already done that research, come to the same conclusion, but didn't publish their findings. And that's why they didn't want to give him access to the royal mummies. So you'll be amazed at the great lengths people will go to to make sure that we don't know the truth about our history and culture. Wow. I hope people out there are listening and obviously this is being recorded and it's being recorded on YouTube and you guys are getting some, some, uh, some free, some free game right now, getting some free game to hopefully inspire you to want to go ahead and do some other things too as well. We'll talk about it at the end because this brother, brother Kua has a large catalog of materials. And like I said, I have some. And he can talk about that kind of stuff at the end. But you get some free game right now and also do your own research. Do your own research as well, okay? I'm going to skip the rest of this video because unless you have anything else to say about this clip. No, just that I, I was taught that knowledge ain't free. You got to pay attention. <laughs> That's pay right. Attention. That's right. 100%. 100%. <laughs> So the most remarkable civilizations of West Africa, right? And we talked a little bit, um, we mentioned them earlier. I'll just start this clip, but then I'll pull up the next slide, which we'll go and we'll just have a conversation around those things here. Unknown to most people, hundreds of smaller kingdoms have popped out through Africa's history, with some eventually growing into powerful empires. These vast right, gold mine 
We start with Ghana, the kingdom of, of Ghana. Ghana. Ancient Ghana, which sat on an immense gold mine, was so rich that even its dogs wore collars made of the precious metal. With strategic planning, powerful leaders, and an abundance of natural resources, Ghana soon became another big African influence. Trading with Europeans and North Africans, Ghana imported books, cloth, and horses in exchange for gold and ivory. Salt was also in high demand. Arab businessmen often struggled for months to reach the kingdom and trade. If someone was accused of breaking the law in Ghana, that person was forced to drink an acrid blend of wood and water. If he threw up the mixture, he was considered innocent. Otherwise, he was considered guilty and punished by the king. Despite holding off many invasions, Ghana eventually collapsed in 1240. Isolated from trade and weakened by its rivals, the kingdom was absorbed into the growing Mali Empire. Number seven. So, I'm going to pause right there. I have not been. I'm looking forward to going. Here's my book back here, you know, the 1619 Project in the Year of Return. And that, 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 that. And I've been doing a lot of, you know, YouTubing and things of that nature. And I know you've been a couple of times. Either of you like to add anything to what they said regarding Ghana? I just would encourage you to go. Um, I think um, for, for several reasons, not only for the historical and for the cultural, but because I believe that all African-Americans should examine international options. I believe we all have to, um, you know, <laughs> things are very volatile in America. 100% and, brother. And uh, while I believe that America belongs to us, I still think it's it's still best to have international options and to forge relationships with our brothers and sisters on the continent because they're sitting on top of the wealth of the world and they're waiting for us to return. And when you return, uh, it will be not like nothing else that you've ever experienced yeah. uh, because you'll be embraced uh, by your own people. But you're also going to see some very disturbing things. When I went, mm -hmm. um, our guide and one of my elders, he... he he said, you're looking through a dual lens. On the one hand, you're seeing what the British colonials left behind. Mm. So when Ghana gained its independence in 1957, the British took out all the infrastructure. And, and, and they're still uh, con in control of a great deal of resources in Ghana. But the second part of that lens is you're seeing the beauty and the resilience of the people to survive and persist despite those oppressive conditions. So I don't want to romanticize about it so much that you, you know, think that it's that it's all good because it's not all good. Right. But it is a beautiful and wonderful experience. And I think all all of us should experience it at some point or another on our journey. Yeah. Within the next year yeah. or so I'm definitely making that trip. Go ahead, brother. Dr. Brown, you got something? Yeah, I, yeah, I I I uh I'm definitely gonna go on the the more cultural side, right? The cultural foundation side. And um I want to kind of say a story I think about me growing up you know I grew up in Canada and so I wasn't really exposed to a lot of um movies and things like that but uh when I was 21 I actually saw the movie Scarface and with all of the hip-hop that I knew of up to that point I finally saw the movie and so much of hip-hop samples and lyrics and all of that came from that movie I couldn't believe how much I already knew about a movie that I'd never even seen. That's mm. what it's like going to Ghana. It's mm. like going back and seeing the foundation of so much of what we already have here. When we talk about the rhythms and we talk about the drums and we talk about the uh, the patterns and we talk about the uh, all of these different cultural elements, so much of that exists in Africa and in West Africa and in Ghana. Right. I think it's going to be it's going to amaze a lot of people to realize how much uh, how many connections there are and how much of that culture is built into the foundation of African-American culture. Um, but like was said, let's not romanticize this. Right. That there um, that there were some flaws and there were some shortcomings and there were all of these things that exist. But I think it's also important to um, value it and still honor it because it's ours because it's ours. 
hundred percent. All right. We should have next small clip on Mali. The Mali Empire. The Mali Empire was a major African civilization that thrived between the 13th and 16th centuries. Founded by a man named Sundiata Keita, aka the Lion King, the empire was located near present-day West Africa. While the Lion King was an impressive ruler, the empire flourished the most under Mansa Musa, who holds the title of the richest man in history. His fortune was worth a whopping $400 billion, an amount that puts Bill Gates to shame. Musa also made Timbuktu, the Mali capital, the main center for education and culture in Africa, allowing scholars from all over the continent to come and study. Like Benin, Mali was successful in trade because of its location by the Niger River. However, it was plundered by invaders from Morocco in 1593. Absolutely. This weekend, the if you could go back like five seconds, not even five seconds, where it was showing that map where he's holding the gold nugget right there. Right yes, there. So that map was drawn by Europeans and it shows Mansa Musa holding a gold nugget. And while that's a monumental part of our history and culture and the magnificence of Mansa Musa and everything, it call, there's a lesson that we can learn from that. And that is, uh, don't always show what you have. And I'm mm. not necessarily suggesting that he did, but I think wealth was just so abundant in Mali at that time, you couldn't not notice it, especially if you came from scarcity like they did in Europe. Right. And so when they saw that, so... They literally made a map saying we have to go to this place to get their resources. Mm. I think when we build, the lesson for us is that when we build, sometimes we have to build in silence until mm. what we've built has such a strong foundation that it doesn't matter who tries to attack it when they find out it's already strong enough that it can stand on its own. So that's just something that came to mind uh, that, that always comes to mind whenever I see that map that they built. They were intent on finding the gold and they're still intent on finding the gold in our communities and in us, the gold that we don't even see in ourselves. Everybody knows how powerful we are. We're the only ones who don't recognize it in ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I also think that when it comes to, you know, make a great point about him holding the nugget in this picture. And I think that when we look at it through a sort of um, European lens, and the priorities and values that European culture has on money starts to become primary. I think it 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 it, it discounts all of the other non sort of gold non uh, uh, financial stuff that's valuable in Africa, that's valuable in Ghana. When you talk about spiritual systems, systems of maturation, when you talk about community structures and 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 community um, philosophies, right, around building, around coming together and families and things like that. All of that is rich culture. It wasn't just the gold. To be honest with you, I think it's interesting the way, you know, we, we oftentimes want to recognize the fact that we had kings and queens in our lineage or in our, in our heritage, I'll say. But I think we have to be really honest that we don't over-romanticize this thing. Most of us come from farmers, right? Most of us. And that doesn't make us any less valuable. That just because we have kings and queens in Africa to recognize that, I think what we're trying to do, I understand that I get it. We're trying to show that we were not the uh, uncivilized people that European folks will claim and try to depict us as. I get it. I get it. You know, we were great people, but understand we were great for a number of reasons, not just because we wore crowns, not just because we had gold nuggets. We were great because of the way we moved, the way we treated each other, the way we connected with spirituality, the way we connected with ourselves, the uh, great the, the philosophies that we had and in, in understanding our existence, the connections we had to our ancestors, the way we honored our elders. That's what made us great. There is a question in the in the box. Are you, are you able to see the Q&A box on your end, gentlemen, either of you? 
I can hear you, Dr. Cook. Let's be on mute. I don't, there's nothing in the chat box from what I can see. Okay, so if there's a question I'm gonna read, I'm, here. I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Oh, go ahead. You want to read it? No, go ahead. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. Okay. Can you discuss, this is by uh, Dr. Mark Latta. Can you discuss some of the principles of the transition of manhood in African culture? And what are your thoughts of the current state uh, of healthy masculinity, regardless of sexuality? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I guess I can start with some, with some of that and, and, and folks can jump in, but... Um, they had what's called these rites of passage rituals, right? Um, it was a process of maturation. It wasn't just once you turn 18, you're a man, you're a woman. That's not how they did it. You had to go through a process to learn things. And it wasn't until you completed that process that you were looked at as a man or a woman in particular communities. Some of this had to do with a number of things of knowing about your own community and the history of it. Uh, some of it had to do with going out into the wilderness and learning things about yourself, overcoming challenges, being comfortable with who you were, learning about different philosophies and learning about different ideas of right and wrong. And all of these things were entailed into this these sort of rites of passage rituals. Um, today, when we're talking, uh, talking about being a man or being a woman, um, Part of the sensitivity that, that Black folks have is that we were not looked at as men and not looked at as, as grown women, no matter how old you were. That certain periods of time, you know, we were called boy, no matter how old you were as a Black man. As a black man. And so we come, become very sensitive around that to where uh, at every turn we want to sort of claim this manhood. But that's not necessarily how it went in African, pre-colonial African culture. Um, there was a process, and it was a process for a particular reason, because once you became a man, um, you were expected to contribute to the progress and, and the uh, advancement of a community and the maintenance of a community. Yeah, that that is so important, uh, what Dr. Brown has mentioned, because when you think about what is the rites of passage into adulthood for us in America, or just for America in general, mm. People on their 18th or 21st birthday, they may get drunk, they may get high, they may have illicit sex, and, and this is their passage into manhood or womanhood. That is so far, so distant from what our original rites of passage was. The understanding was that you, you, you may have been born uh, as a male or female, but you had to evolve into manhood and womanhood. And that didn't just happen by chance. It was a structured process. So you left the community as a boy or a girl to go through your rites of passage. And you were you returned to the community and were represented to the community as a man or a woman. Because during your rites of passage, and you were treated as such, because during your rites of passage, you, you learned the knowledge of, of, of yourself and of your people and of the world and of nature. You learn how to protect and provide for yourself, your family, and your community. None of these things were 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 uh, by chance, but all of these things now today are left to chance in our communities because many of the structures of socialization that are going on are out of our control, or we haven't uh, retaken control of those sorts of things. So, yeah, I'm very concerned about. Um, uh, the lack of functional Black men that we have in our communities, families, and schools. And further, you have generations of children and women who have never seen a functional, healthy Black man, both mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. You have generations of young people who have never seen a functional marriage, loving, functional, supportive relationship. That's deeply problematic, and that is not by chance. But it all goes back to the disruption of our rites of passage uh, systems. Yeah, yeah. That's and 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 and, and Dr. Lada, real quick, Dr. Lada. Um, he also mentioned in there sort of like outside of sexuality. And I think it's important to kind of recognize this, this idea of masculinity and femininity and things like that, that a lot of times these rites of passage 
uh, rituals go well beyond that, right? We're talking about learning um, things like uh, how to how to be humble, right? Learning about humility and the value and importance of humility. Learning about when and how to apologize and make amends for things. Like these are the ritual practices that were going on, right? How to use your how to use your privilege or your power when you do have it for good, especially when there's other folks around you who don't have that privilege and power, right? This ain't got nothing to do whether you can hit a baseball or not. And it has everything to do with how you, how you are valued, not how you valued, the value that you have and that you bring to a community. It's understanding that each of us are different. And it's the differences that actually make us a better community because without you, we wouldn't have it. Mm. And so we need you because what you bring is something different, something new, something that we don't necessarily have. And as long as we can all come together with our differences, with our likenesses and get on the same rhythm, mm. we're going to be all right. Mm. We're going to be all right. It's like music, right? You're I'm thinking hip hop. I'm, I'm thinking hip hop. I'm, I'm all, just listening. Yeah. <laughs> you, know. you got these. You got these rhythms and polyrhythms. You got the bass guitar. You got the, um, yeah. you know, the saxophone. You got the drums. You got five different types of drums. You got all of these things. You got the vocals, right? You got the, all these things, the polyrhythms going on. As long as we can all get on the same rhythm, it benefits us to have different sounds, different uh, instruments, different approaches, and things like that. As long as we get on the same on the same rhythm, it actually makes our community, makes our sound better. There's another question in the box right here that it says it's from Mark Wilson. I'm gonna that's my brother Mark Wilson, who may have gone to Lafayette as well, actually, and play, coached a little football against me. He was a coach at a Emotep years ago, and we used to battle and we we're colleagues from, from Philadelphia, but not. Uh if you could just read that question real quick, brother, because do you see that question? Oh, I can't see it on my end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Help me you understand how this Help me understand. Help me understand how other civilizations were able to come to Alkubulan uh, and ravage, Akibalan, and ravage yeah. the country, Akibalan, and mm -hmm. ravage the countries. Um, I think it says, "With us, so advanced, so advanced in math, science, how did they develop weapons such uh, that defeated us?" So, I'm going to first say that I think we have to also recognize the type of people that were in West Africa at that time. Were they people who could develop uh, defense systems? Absolutely. When it comes to even European colonization, do we think that, sorry, did the African people at that time believe that there was going to be a group of people so inhumane that they were going to come in and do what they did to African civilizations? Absolutely not. I think in fact, they actually embraced many Europeans. I don't think people understand that. They allowed Europeans into these communities, mm -hmm. right? And then the Europeans learned their styles, learned their secrets, learned their vulnerabilities, and then came in with the guns and the brutality. But I think that when we, when we think about African people, West African people at that time, um, they weren't necessarily thinking of some of these things in terms of colonization. I think that's kind of where we're going, where we're getting at with this, but um, correct me if I'm wrong or, or certainly add in what you will. That's that's sort of kind of, you know, might have been my mindset, you know, in terms of us being more of a piece, don't get it wrong, we can go to war too, but being more scholarly and being more peaceful, allowing people to come in and learn from us. And then like you just said, you see what we got, now they want to go ahead and get that. So, um, but Dr. Yeah. Kua, yeah, we saw the same thing with Native Americans. They just right. had never been exposed to that level of, of barbarity. I'll never forget, I was 15 years old when uh, when I saw the first uh, iteration of the movie, The Color Purple, and I didn't know what I was going to. I was just going with my parents. But when the character of Mr. was portrayed, I was stunned. I just, I had never seen a person a black man or any, I had never seen a person be that evil and vile to it. So I had no point of reference for it. I think the same can be said when 
when the Europeans came into Africa, we were, uh, Sheikh Anta Diab describes it as this. He said, we were uh, xenophilic, meaning we embraced people who had uh, difference. But in European culture, they tend to be xenophobic. They have a fear of people who are different. So we embrace people. Hey, come on in. We got plenty to eat. Come on in. We got we got plenty. You know, share with us. The Native Americans did the same thing. But that became our demise. John Henry Clark said our our greatest humanity uh, became our greatest liability. And so it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like somebody, you know, wandering into the community who's not street smart. You're going to get taken advantage of. And and we just we didn't have that orientation. So we have to learn from that as a people now to be mindful, because some some of our people get to a point where they're they're in search of allies outside of our community. And if you're not careful, you can be inviting the enemy in. I'm not saying that strategic alliances aren't good and helpful, but I'm always wary of those that feel that they have to find somebody, you know, outside of our community. So these are these are things that we have to be mindful of. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome commentary. Um, the next slide was going to be on Song High. Does anyone want to share anything on Song High? I mean, you know, as I, you know, Look at the transition between you know Mali and then into Song High and how essentially um, many of the universities correct me if I'm wrong with my timetable but you know many of the universities pretty much began to gain more prominence um, and during that transition is that pretty accurate, Doctor Akua? Could you make that statement again? What what became more prominent? The universities and so the University of Timbuktu and so on and so forth. Oh yes, became more we, prominent between the transition yeah. between Mali and then Song High. It's funny, brother, because when I was growing up, we had a saying, man, I will knock you all the way to, to Timbuktu. And I never right. knew that that was a real place. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that you're right about that. But I want to talk for just a moment about the language, because embedded in our languages was so much that we can learn about ourselves. Let me take it back to Kemet for just a second, then I'm going to bring it to Songhai. Okay. Uh, in Kemet, the language was called medu nature, mm -hmm. which means word of God or sacred utterances. Well, think about the, the quality of the consciousness and the culture of a people that would name their language word of God or sacred utterances. In the Songhai language, there were certain concepts that were related to our blackness. I'll give you a quick example. And this is coming out of the research of Dr. Joyce King and Hasimi Maiga, who's, who's from Mali. Everything associated with Black in the English language is negative, but in our original languages, everything associated with Black is related to goodness, greatness, and divinity. So for example, in the Songhai language, um, if you wanted, there's a term called Hari Bibi, which means Black water. So if you're gonna give me some water, don't get me some water by the edge of the river where people have been washing their bathing themselves and washing their clothes and stuff, go out a little further into the middle of the river and get me that Hari Bibi, that black water. That the most refreshing water was referred to as black water. Labu Bibi was black earth. The most fertile ground that you could plant your crops in was called Labu Bibi, which was black earth. And then uh, when the sun was on high and the most uh, at, at its hottest, it was called. Uh, Wene Bibi, Black Sun. So everything was associated with Blackness was that which was potent. I think the most powerful example is Chini Bibi, which means Black Word. In the beginning was the Black Word, and the Black Word has the power to make things move and transform. So the powerful word was the Black Word. So even in our languages, uh, you, you have this sense of sacredness that we don't find in the English language or, or other European languages. And this is one of the problems with the fact that our languages were taken from us. So that's what makes me think of when I think of uh, Songha. Nice. Dr. Brown, want to add anything to that? No, no, I, th I think that's good. I think that, you know, talking about uh, Songha and, and um, I, I think the different empires take turns, right? Kind of becoming the main empire and whatnot. But I think what's interesting and what's important to know is that these were high trade areas, 
These were where so many people from around, not just Africa, but all over other places as well, were coming to kind of figure out um, what they could get and how they could do trade. Um, they mentioned in one of the videos that, that sometimes it would take months for people to get there just so they could do trade. And so it became this hub of trade and this very vibrant place in itself, um, those different kingdoms, those different, those different areas. And so when we think of ancient Africa, when we think of you know the the earlier years of Western of, of West African civilization. A lot of times, people will get these myths that they were somehow you know living in trees, right? And I think that we have to acknowledge that it was actually the opposite. That they were they were the center of trade and the center of all of this the, these these this gold that was going on at that time. Um, I just kind of wanted to add that piece. Nice. Earlier in the clip, it mentioned Mansa and Musa. I mean, just go through right now because, you know, we're staying on. we can do this all night, but I know you guys have things to do, such as I do in the panel, you know, and, and, the, and the viewers out there in, the, in their evenings as well. But Mansa and Musa. And one of the things I always ask the children that I still work with to this day, I say, who's the richest man of all time? And they'll say Jeff Bezos, or now they say Elon Musk, you know, so that gives me a nice segue into talking about Mansa and Musa. And essentially, the wealth that he had, I think they said about $400 billion versus what Elon Musk has, which is still nothing to, you know, squint at, um, $200 billion, right? But still, 400 to 200 you know, it's double that. Um, any comments that you have about Mansa Musa and his wealth? I don't think we recognize how, I don't think we recognize how much money that actually was. He would go to certain communities and just drop donations. And his donations would throw off the whole economy of that area, right. of that area, right. right? Like he was dropping so much just in his, just giving, giving stuff away that now it, it, would, it would throw off the economic value of gold at that time. Um, mm. So I think that we, we really don't even recognize how much money, I probably still can't even recognize exactly how much money that is. And I think, too, the message that we carry forth from that today is that in, in many of our communities, I've noticed that we have people who have capital, but not the consciousness. So the cap mm. they got the capital, they got the money, uh, but don't have the, the, the social and cultural consciousness or mindset that should go with it. And, and then in other places in our community, you have people who have the consciousness, but no capital. And typically, these two groups tend to butt heads, like people with the consciousness look at the people with the capital and say, hey, you should be building black schools and you should build black businesses and you should be rooted in the community. And the people with the capital say, hey, you need to stop complaining. You need to save your money, get a job, invest your money. America's the best place in the world. And what I've discovered over the years is that the people with the capital and the consciousness are, are in two camps butting heads. I realized uh, early on that I needed to be that brother who could raise capital and consciousness to do the mm. work that's necessary to be done in our communities. And, and here's the other thing that I noticed. Young people are not attracted to struggle. And then one of the reasons is because many of them are already struggling. And I think our people mm. in general are not attracted to struggle. And so it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we teach our people ways of of making money and living abundantly by empowering your people rather than exploiting your people. And I like to think that that's part of the message that, uh, that, that Mansa Musa brings us is that, you know, he, he, he had wealth, not just personal wealth, but it was wealth as a result of an empire that he was over and that the people shared in that wealth. So in our next segment, and I appreciate both of you for being on here this evening. You've been dropping science, dropping knowledge, everything all night long. Um, it's just talk about sharing of resources. So, Dr. Akua, if you want, you can share. Um, you can share some information if you have something ready to share, because you're actually listed as one of the resources for parents. Um, so, if you want to just share from your browser, feel right ahead. But I can definitely talk about yourself too as well. So, oh, okay, you can, sure. I you didn't can know share. That. You can share. You can share the screen if you like. Okay. Um, it'll take me a minute to bring it up so uh, Dr. Brown can go first, and then I'd be glad to share some of okay. the resources that I can provide. Not a problem. You want to talk about what we talked about earlier, Dr. Brown? Or is that, that, that too much information right now up front, or you want to...
do like a like a save the date type thing, or are we there yet? You you on mute. You on mute. You on mute. Because that's yeah, awesome. We it now. Okay, cool. That was awesome. I, I want the world to know about it. Oh, are you talking about the book? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle of completing uh, my manuscript. I have one book out. It's sitting right up there. Um, Sports and African American history and culture. Uh, and you can grab that book. Uh, it's an edited volume, but I'm also working on my sole authored manuscript that looks at um, Black sporting culture of the 90s and 2000s. Um, it's called Baller Culture. And it really looks at not just, um, <laughs> it doesn't just look at Allen Iverson, although Allen Iverson certainly embodies, is probably the, the strongest embodiment of baller culture, but it looks at the way Black folks were able to, through cultural sort of activism and resistance, able to show their creativity that is really based in in their African heritage of rhythm and call and response and and spontaneity with the with the province sorry uh, um, uh, rhythm and call and response and repetition with spontaneity. Um, but it also looks at the way they're able to resist cultural assimilation, right? Um, Allen Iverson not refusing refusing to cut it off his hair or talk a certain way. Um, it also allows Black folks to develop a certain identity that they maybe couldn't do in other platforms, but sports, they have the leverage to be able to develop their identity goals the way they want to as well. And so the book goes through different things, historical stuff, contemporary things when it comes to culture, when it comes to style of play and fashion and attitudes and language and all of that stuff. Um, it runs the gamut when it comes to cultural characteristics that it covers. Looking forward to that book, man. Like I said, I was a huge AI fan. That's probably the only time I had season tickets to the Sixers is when he played for him because I was such a Georgetown fan. So I just followed him from Georgetown to the Sixers. So looking forward to that as well as everyone else you mentioned. So Dr. Cole, you should have sharing rights now. You should be able to share. Yeah, so I can share my screen. Unfortunately, it's not allowing me to share sound, but I will share the screen. One of our okay. uh, best um, resources is Reading Revolution Online. And you can access it at readingrevolution.org. I'm showing you behind the scenes. Basically, it is a collection of 90 reading selections that are set up uh, with four activities to go with each one, okay? And so um, since, you, since we heard about Sundiata in one of the videos and we've been talking about Mansa Musa, I'll click on this one. And what you'll see, see, is that for each one we have our vocabulary activities. We call it Bob, we call it Baobab vocabulary because in African tradition, the Baobab tree, it's called the tree of life. Mm -hmm. um, and so we believe that doing these activities will bring life to our children's vocabulary development, reading comprehension, critical thinking, and communication skills. So these are the words that the a student, the, the student will encounter in the reading selection. Down here is the reading selection with the vocabulary words underlined for easy access. And then we have a captioned video to go with each of the reading selections. And each captioned video is right around three minutes because we know um, that unfortunately our, our children's attention span is not as long as we would like for it to be, but it offers our children and teachers uh, and parents an opportunity to get a snapshot of who this person was. And it's a captioned video so that our children are learning to read more fluently and with better comprehension as they're seeing the words across the screen with the video images, beautiful images of people who look like them. So there is a comprehension activity, a vocabulary development activity, a grammar and writing activity to go with each of the 90 reading selections. I wanna encourage everybody to go to readingrevolution.org and you can get a free demo. Again, readingrevolution.org, and you can get a free demo. But in addition to that, when you go to readingrevolution.org, and I need to make sure that you can see what I can see. Are you seeing Reading Revolution and a picture of an elder holding a book in front of a youth? Yes. Okay, so when you go to this website, and then you click on Parents, you can get Reading Revolution online at a significant discount. 
Okay. So I want to encourage everybody to check that out and not only check it out for yourself, but please share it with your school, your, your child's teacher and principal, because uh, Reading Revolution Online is being used in a number of schools and school districts around the country. But certainly we want to reach, our goal is to reach a million black children to close these literacy gaps that are a result of persistent access and opportunity gaps. We know our children can read. We know our children are brilliant, uh, but a lot of times they don't have the right teaching and the right content. We, we decided we didn't wanna just talk about the problem. We wanted to create the solution and that's what we did. It's called Reading Revolution Online. There are a lot of districts who have resources to purchase materials like this, but in some places, and they may not know that it exists. So please let your child's teacher and principal know about Reading Revolution Online. Uh, we're changing a lot of lives. And just to give you an idea of the impact that it's having, I'm gonna scroll down and show you what some administrators are saying about Reading Revolution. These are a few of the black heroes and sheroes, ancient and modern, that our young people are reading about in Reading Revolution. But let's look at what Sister Jacqueline Harriet has to say. She's up in Canada. She said, we've been using Reading Revolution Online to provide supplemental literacy instruction to our students in our after-school cultural academic enrichment programs across the province in Nova Scotia since 2021. Our teachers, site coordinators, and support staff have reported increased engagement, growth in reading, and achievement using this unique resource. And then Dr. Marcus Jackson, who's just outside of Dallas, Texas, and Lancaster Independent School District, he says, as educators, our goal is to ignite a flame that burns for knowledge. For years, Reading Revolution has been able to ignite that flame for many of my students by improving reading levels by one to 2.5 grade levels in a year. Mm -hmm. I strongly recommend this resource. And lastly, we have Ms. Latanya Stevens, an assistant principal at Inkster Prep just outside of Detroit, who reports similar findings that their, their uh, students grew an average of 1.7 years growth in reading. And she says at the bottom, it's highlighted, we truly believe that Reading Revolution was an integral part of this growth. For the next year, we ordered most of the materials offered by Dr. Akua and his teacher transformation team. So I share all this to say, we don't just talk about problems, we've developed solutions for those that are interested. And I want to encourage everyone to go to readingrevolution.org and take advantage of that. Absolutely, man. Man, listen, listen. I say, as you would always say, I say, I say, man, like ever since my days at uh, you know, at Harambe years ago, when we first met or whatever, yeah. I've always supported your your work and, and your business. So I appreciate the work that you do. Like I said, you're you're the new um, you know, to me, the, the new Asa Hill, you're the new um What's my guy? Jawan is good for all those guys, all those guys to the all the books that I have over here. You're right. You're definitely doing your thing out there, brother. So I appreciate you for doing what you do out there for our culture, for our people. Um, any other announcements you guys want to make? Any any other plans? Anything you want to, you know, drop on the people before we get out of here? I just want to say thank you for hosting this. There's a select group of people that that when they call or text, um th that I respond. And uh and you're one of them, brother. Uh um, I appreciate you. That's, that's I why I had to, you. you know let class out a couple of minutes early. I said I got to be on with Brother Damon because he's always on the case for the race. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you. Yeah, I want to thank both of you all. Um, both of you all have a great, great discussion. Uh necessary, always relevant. And um want to make sure we just be able to honor the the spirit and the legacy of our ancestor, um, Dr. Woodson. Shame. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So I'm just gonna share screen real quick because again, you know, it's not just about, you know, me, obviously, I'd like to shout out the Middletown chapter, Middletown, oh, that's the Townsend chapter of NAACP for allowing me to partner with them on this uh, initiative, you know, for this series for this month, and we'll be back um, next week, um, next Monday, where we're going to talk about overcoming chattel enslavement. Brothers, if you're free, please come back. You know, I would love to see you. Hopefully, Brother Ishmael will join us as well, so we can dig into that topic. 
And then we have two other weeks after that. I know you have classes and things of that nature. You might not be able to be here, but if you can, I greatly appreciate you. Um, the other thing is, for those out there that are still with us, you know, just my little plug here, you know, around peace. And here's my QR code here. You can go to my website, my contact information. If any of you out there that are watching want to copy these slides, I'll send them to you. You know, just connect with me there You know, with the QR code. Also I have a t-shirt. This is out right now. EQ over IQ equals a better you. I'm wearing it right now. This is the purple and gold version. That's sort of an exclusive version, but I can you know, make different colors for anybody out there. And essentially it's saying that your EQ, your emotional quotient is just as important, if not more important than your IQ. If you can't handle yourself and know how to deal with other people, it doesn't matter how much you know. So I have those. You can go to my website and let me know what you need out there. So um, pretty much that's it for the evening. And again, brothers, I appreciate, appreciate you for coming on here tonight. Those that have been hanging on there on Zoom all night long on, on face, Facebook and, and YouTube, we appreciate you all. Um, thank you for coming out. God bless you all. Good night. Hold on for a second, brothers.